new choices, new players, new models of care. You know consumer first healthcare is everywhere. For us to build the future, to see what's new, we gotta look at the world from a different point of view. Consumer innovation ain't going away. I say it's here to stay, today it leads the way. We gotta drop the silos, we're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. So join us now, join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, or like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rap. Yo, come on, let's go. Welcome back to the leading podcast about consumer innovation. I'm Jared Johnson, founder of Shift Forward Health, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about refining our focus in the new year. As the new rap intro states, consumer innovation isn't going away. So why should we double down on these macro and micro innovations? And how can we stay at the forefront of the next wave that's coming? I'll talk about that. Then we wrap up our 2024 predictions series, where we're sharing predictions for consumer transformation in the coming year and beyond. James Gardner returns to review what we predicted a year ago and then offer some new takes on what could be coming from different corners of the industry. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. Did you catch it? There's a new healthcare app at the beginning of this podcast offering a refined focus for the future. It's no coincidence that it's debuting at the beginning of a new year when we're conditioned to renew our focus. The new intro wrap focuses on consumer innovation, which will also be the theme of the new season starting today. It starts by saying that with new choices, new players, and new models of care, in order for us to build the future, we have to look at the world differently. It then describes how consumer innovation isn't going away. There's a new wave of momentum behind these micro and macro innovations. And finally, it reminds us that to make progress, we have to drop the silos. We're all the same team, folks. So what's the through line? We'll be going wider and deeper about consumer innovation than any other source. I'll say this. On this show, we champion a lot of non-traditional offerings, and for many reasons, one of which is that we see the shortcomings of trying to solve all of the challenges of healthcare in this country through traditional sick care and a hospital insurance-based paradigm. I, for one, believe that companies that understand consumers have full rights to offer their own healthcare services. So it's funny because I still hear people say, say that only existing healthcare organizations should offer healthcare. I read it again in a post just a few days ago, but I believe that we should let new players play. If they truly offer healthcare in consumer-minded ways that are built around everyday people's needs and expectations, let them offer it. I'm cheering for a healthier country where more people achieve better health and wellness regardless of where it comes from or how it's offered. That speaks to one of my core tenets, one of my consumer concepts, if you will, that consumerism isn't just about everyday people having choices for their care. It's the fact that they have expectations for how it should go. And when we ignore those expectations, fewer people utilize the system and get the care they need. So convenience is only part of the conversation. Throughout the year, we'll also be highlighting lots of consumer innovation from the health system point of view and celebrating their progress. So the intro wrap concludes by inviting everyone to join the revolution. Some people don't like that word. They think it's too big, but there is a revolution, even if you can't notice it yet or prefer to call it something else. The fact is there are thousands of people just like you working in this industry with an interest in consumer innovation. We all want to get better at building, designing, and marketing consumer-first products, services, and experiences. And this new push for consumer innovation will be one of the things that drives the next phase of transformation in our industry. And I, for one, want to stay at the forefront of that way by exploring the frontiers of consumer innovation and continuing to drive the conversation. Does that describe you too? Then this wrap is for you, and that's what you can expect throughout this new year. 300 episodes in, and we're just getting started, folks. I invite you to join us on this journey and refine your own focus on consumer innovations wherever we find them. That's another way that we'll build the health curve tomorrow. Tomorrow, and that's the flavor of the week. The flow, the flow, the flow. All right, let's get back into the flow, everyone. Today is the start of our 10th season as we wrap up our 2024 predictions series. If you haven't tuned into the previous episodes, I highly encourage you to do that. You can check out our predictions that we had here with Dr. Zev Newworth, with Ann Summers Hogg, Jane Saracen Khan, Amy Hamans, and then Zane and I spoke last week. So I couldn't be more pleased to welcome back our regular correspondent today, James Gardner. James, welcome back. Jared, it's exciting to be here. I'm a little nervous about looking back at last year's predictions, but I think they were more right than wrong. But let's see. Yeah, we'll see. You know, as always, we could probably find a grain of truth and accuracy in just about anything. And I think you'll find we have more than just a, a little bit here and there. We were, I think we were, we were 
for the most part, headed down the right track and, and seeing things correctly. And, and, you know, as much as anyone can really, truly predict things, that, that's kind of the fun of this. But this is the first year where we're, we are looking back at the previous year's predictions and seeing you know, how things shaped out. So hopefully this will be part of our, our regular annual tradition here because this is one of the highlights of the year for sure for me is, is doing these these series. And for those who have not tuned in last year or new new listeners for this one, the way this works is we are just going to try to have a little bit of fun about what might be coming when it comes to consumer transformation in the coming year. And sometimes we look a little further out, but we do take a look at trends. You can definitely say that. What we're going to do today is just look at a couple things that James and I discussed last year and then offer some additional predictions about where James sees things heading uh, here in, into 2024. So with that, we can roll right in, James. And I, I think I want to leave us in as much time as possible for, for some of these topics that you've got going on. Uh, let me start with the couple that we shared last year uh, this first one was one that you mentioned and it was i like these because they are they were they were both really made me think i th- i feel like you were pulling in a lot of different trends and seeing something even more and i liked that one of them was the acceleration of consumer empowered healthcare uh, so we call it self care sometimes uh, do you want to, let's talk through that one. What were you, you want to recall what you were referring to there? And then uh, what, what did we see this year? Well, I'm feeling good about this uh, specific forecast piece. Self-care or people empowered to take care of themselves and choose when, where, if, and how they seek to care for themselves. I think if anything, that's heightened, we would all say. And it's driven by a couple of things, but most obviously there's access to information like never before. So whether it's Dr. Google or WebMD or the Cleveland Clinic's resources or whatnot, the ability to figure out what's ailing you is easier and faster and simpler than ever before. But there's also incentives. Close to 100 million people in America, some say, have high deductible health plans, which essentially lock them out of the system short of a catastrophic, catastrophic need for care. So if you've got skin in the game, you're incented to think twice about where you seek care and if you seek care because you're looking for value for your money, um, again, short of a catastrophic situation. So I like that forecast piece. I'd give that a 10 out of 10. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're off to a solid start here. I, I agree, especially as we look at what's next for consumer transformation. I've heard things referred to as like consumerism 2.0, but the evolution of the fact of what we were all talking about in the early onset of when consumerism was just being coined as a phrase of the trend you just mentioned, high deductible health plans, cash, the cash pay economy that's sitting below the healthcare ecosystem that was not a trend many years ago, but just adding that as a possibility was one thing that drove a lot of business decisions to make things more consumer friendly, to put your provider reviews up there, to make online scheduling happen, and to put patient education information out there to try to bring people in who are searching more and having more choices. I've always loved this. I've been thinking about it this year because the result of it has been the fact that when we're talking, especially here on this podcast, when we talk about consumer transformation, we use these big terms, (laughs) we talk about consumer innovation too. To me, the reason for that, it's time for us to evolve what we mean by consumerism. It's not just the fact that consumers have choices anymore for their care, it's that they have expectations. And we've talked about it before, but that's a big part of what's going to drive the next phase of what consumer transformation looks like is because, yeah, there's an expectation attached with it. I'm not going to settle for this being such a horrific experience to get scheduled or to find out this information from my insurance plan. I'm going to go find another provider. And I think that will enter in a lot more of, of choices here. So I, I really like this one. I think you're right. Spot on. 10 out of 10. Is it okay that I'm judging myself? <laughs> uh, yes, that's what we do on this program. So, <laughs> you know, we, we'll be mostly transparent and and you know, fair with ourselves, I'd like to say. So <laughs> I think it was good enough for me. The other main one that you spoke about last year was on the marketing side, just an acceptance by marketers that this amount of cases and, and, and care that was deferred immediately after the pandemic isn't necessarily coming back. And so we're kind of past that initial resurgence of patients coming back. And now we have to realize that there's this whole 
issue of there's a perishable inventory. There's a certain finite number of slots that doctors can see patients. So how do they evolve their best practices for managing and optimizing those slots? What did you see on this one in 2023? Oh, I think we were more right than wrong. Obviously, there were deferred appointments, canceled appointments, canceled procedures through the pandemic. But the hope that those are going to come back, I think, is a fallacy. You know, if you skip a haircut, doesn't mean you're going to get two next year. Um, you know, it's, it's that kind of thinking. What's lost in time is lost in time forever. So marketers need to just embrace that new reality that there is no surge around the corner of uh, deferred appointments and deferred procedures. It's business as usual. And we need to compete hard and convince people to seek the care that they need. It's a sobering thought. And yet I, I think you're right. If, you know, the marketing strategy, which I understand it tends to be more of a, like six to 12 month plan versus it used to be a three to five year plan. And now it's more like, hey, let's, let's get through the next six months. Maybe we can look at 12 months down the road. Those strategies now do evolve, involve less thought of, oh, well, just wait until that sur- that next surge comes back and wait until people, you know, get their, their care that they deferred again. Yeah, you're, I think you're right. I think we're past that initial window and it's not going to be seen in the same way where we can count on it to grow the business. And so it's it's an important part of, of the strategy is to recognize that and to indeed focus. I, I think that does lead to where you were speaking of focusing on the existing inventory, if you will. You know, I don't I don't think it's a crime to think of it in merchandising terms anymore. These are a finite slot, like the inventory of things that you're offering are time slots with a doctor or a provider of some sort at any rate. So how do we maximize that? How do we optimize that? That will be like at the focus of a lot more that happens on the marketing side of things. And I do think that that leads them to investigate and explore more platforms that help them with that and, and more MarTech there, if you will. So yeah, I liked that one a lot. I agree. I'll, I'll just add, I've had the good fortune recently of interviewing a series of healthcare CMOs, the elite select few that are really at the forefront of our industry. And they're increasingly embracing this idea of capacity and utilizing the inventory of their doctor's availability. And it's taking a beat from a practice that hotels and restaurants and airlines have instinctively known forever, that a doctor's schedule is essentially inventory. And if there's empty slots, uh, it's like an airplane taking off with empty seats that could have been used. So optimizing and maximizing you know, the filling of physician schedules increasingly is a metric that I'm seeing in these conversations. So I, I give us a 10 out of 10 on that prediction. Yeah, and I, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't be surprised if we were talking about that a lot more a year from now. So we'll see. That doesn't count as an official prediction. <laughs> but, but, you know. <laughs> okay, so I know you had a couple you wanted to share for this coming year. Do you want to start working down that list? Absolutely. So as many listeners know, uh, retail health is a passion of mine been following Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, and others uh, going on three or four years now. And um, I found it a fascinating topic because I believe they are the disruptors of primary care and we're watching it unfold in real time. And my prediction for 2024 is in maturing the relationships that retail health organizations have with the traditional healthcare system. I don't think we're going to see bold acquisitions by CVS or Amazon or whatnot like we did in 2022 and 2023. I think we're going to see more collaboration and partnerships between the two factions. And I'll just give a shout out to an example in Orlando, where Orlando Health, a very traditional and uh, large health system, has partnered with Walmart Health, who operates a number of health clinics in the community. Obviously, the clinics don't offer emergency care and acute care. And there's a natural synergy between the two. If you're looking for a place to have a knee replacement or a hip replacement, the physician at Walmart Health will now be in a position to seamlessly, through Epic and collaboration tools, to um, ensure that patient gets care uh, within the Orlando Health System. So I think we're going to see more and more partnerships and agreements uh, between the two systems to ensure collaboration is the norm as opposed to head-to-head competition. Wow, I think this is a deep rabbit hole we could go down. I'll try to venture down just a little bit because I think you're so spot on here and I think we'll be talking about different types of partnerships as we go further along. Mm, yeah. Not just a, hey, the retailer provides primary care and they refer into us and we're the the regional health system and specialty system of choice. 
for them, which I do think we'll, we will see more of those. I think, well, at the same time, I feel like the approach or how traditional providers view retailers and new entrants at large will continue to evolve. I think there's less, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're in this space offering us anything. How, how dare they? I think there will still be that. But I think it'll be less of it. I think we'll see more openness to, okay, well, wait a minute. I, I guess they are going to be in our market. <laughs> like, how do we get this to work? Like, how, how do we maximize what our part is here? And yes, the reality is sometimes that does center on what patients' needs are. Sometimes that does focus on how do you grow the business? And hopefully there's an overlap in the two. And that, you know, that's the part that people don't always talk about. But that's what the hope is, is that it, you are benefiting the growth of all the organizations, and you're also enabling care that helps people at the end of the day. So I can see more care at home partnerships. I can see more value-based care partnerships. You know, we had Dr. Mohammed Diab on last year from the CEO of CVS Accountable Care, which I, I didn't know anything about until we had him on. And you know, he was mentioning partnerships they have with with Catholic Health and with Rush. And others. So, you know, being in an accountable care relationship with a retailer, it's kind of an interesting take on things. And so I do, I do think we're going to see partnerships in a lot of different ways. And maybe that becomes more, more accepted, I guess, <laughs> you know, more, more willingness to talk about it of the fact of, I think there was a lot of resistance in general to anyone coming in to the industry. And again, we're still going to see it, but I think less of it, of just leave healthcare to the people who offer healthcare and have always done it and been doing it for 100 years. Just let us keep doing it. Yeah, there's an acknowledgement. I do think, like you said, there are organizations that are going to be more naturally prone to do that and think that way versus others. So yeah, I like this one a lot. Yeah, I'll just leave a final thought. Um, a challenge for healthcare leaders is going to be Competing and collaborating simultaneously, uh, especially for those with employed physicians uh, out in the community who will be head to head with these retail health clinics. At the same time, the specialty physicians at those health systems are going to be benefiting from referrals. So there's going to be yin and yang, which will be challenging to navigate, but it'll be a sign of leadership for those who can do it successfully. Well, right. And hasn't Optum helped us uh, understand that we have to be frenemies all along anyway? So it's just kind of more of that, right? I love that term. You're exactly right. Let me jump to another one, and I'll give a shout out to our friend Alan Shoebridge, frequent guest on on the podcast. He's a communications leader with Providence out on the West Coast, and he's at the tip of the spear of identifying labor turmoil as a 2024 theme. And I completely agree with him. Uh, we've seen labor strife already in 2023, and I can see it getting worse, magnified by you know a few forces, which you're very familiar with, Jared. There's immense shortages of clinicians and shortages cause stress and overwork. <laughs> There's also just a growing sense that a lot of the reasons why clinicians went into healthcare are somewhat fading away as the business becomes more and more commercially oriented and driven by dollars and cents. I hear that from clinicians that I speak with, that a lot of what made them passionate about healthcare uh, seems to have faded away. Um, and then, of course, there's just ongoing burnout and stress and anxiety driven by clinical documentation and a number of other factors. You add up all those things and you've got a recipe for very angry and upset people that want change. They want respect and they're not going to sit on their hands and wait for things to improve. They're going to take action. Wow. You know, you're making me think of a few different areas here because while we do focus on what's the consumer point of view here, what's the innovation that's benefiting their care all along the way, we have been fortunate enough to speak with people like Dr. Gordon Chen or Dr. Chinny Puluru from Walmart and Christopher Habig, even just a, a couple of weeks ago from Freedom Health Works on the direct primary care side. And I, you're just helping me make this, this connection, kind of connect some dots here, where all in all three of their cases and many others who we've had on here, they've each independently brought up the thought of the, the appeal, like their value proposition to providers, because you mentioned that burnout. Working within the existing system isn't just cumbersome for the patients that are treated. It is very cumbersome in many cases for the providers. 
there are folks like Dr. Pooler, uh, you know, who uh, who I understand actually just recently took a, another position, but they're each speaking to the appeal to doctors who are sick of working in the un- quote unquote system. And they are appealing to, you know, do you want to get back to that type of care that brought you into this field in the first place? And they've each separately talked about a lot of the same things of there, there are alternatives for providers. And we all know if the provider experience continues to languish and suffer and lead to burnout and increase the amount of burnout that happens, then we don't have care to happen. There's no healthcare going on. So we have to address it in maybe a more direct way. And that's what some of these thought leaders and and, and leaders within the organizations have shared with us is how they are directly appealing to that. I recall, I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I remember just very recently you just shared you know, a couple of posts from Walmart Health uh, recruiting physicians on LinkedIn and and they're pointing to, hey, do you want to get back to the type of care that that you used to do? I mean, it's interesting how directly they're starting to talk about it. Yeah. So watch for that in 2024. It won't be addressed, at least not sufficiently addressed. So I, I point to Alan as being the canary in the coal mine in recognizing that um, you know we're in for a tumultuous year on the labor front. Let's move on to an, another somewhat obvious prediction, which is in 2024, we have a presidential election and we don't know if there'll be a change of administration. It's not our job to speculate on that. But there's all kinds of issues that are boiling away. Some of them related to the election, uh, some of them not. And we're hearing more and more about prior authorization and that's starting to attract the attention of legislators, um, especially the use of AI to deny prescriptions or deny procedures. That's an obvious issue for legislators to jump on. Providers obviously hate the issue of uh, prior authorization. Patients hate it. So it's an easy win to um, hold congressional hearings and um, roast some of the payers who are egregiously you know, denying coverage. So I'm looking for that. Mergers and acquisitions is another issue where I think we're going to see heightened sense of like regulators paying attention whether it's post deals like Cigna and Humana, which didn't get as far as the regulators even weighing in, but there was speculation that they may have stomped on it if it had advanced. Uh, there's also ongoing health system uh, mergers and acquisitions, and I can expect regulators to be paying an even closer eye on those, especially when they're within region because of the fear of just diminished competition. Yeah, I, I can see that being the key, what you just mentioned of freezing of priorities, if you will, just because of the uncertainty that's that's sure to unfold before us. But things like this, the No Surprises Act and other at least attempts towards more pricing transparency, while there, there's always seemed like there's some good in it, are we in a better place right now than we were before some of these recent regulations and you know, legislation towards these efforts? I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> you know, And so I don't know if, if that will be something that becomes part of of campaigns, of look how much easier we're making it for people to understand their health care and what the reality is of that. So I'll be watching that for sure to see what issues, besides the ones you mentioned, might become part of the rhetoric. Because I, I don't know where to where to focus on right now. I do think you're right, though, that there will be a lot of, of hesitancy to start anything new and try to get momentum for something that isn't already in progress. And so especially when it comes to investments. I think we Zane and I briefly touched on that last week of the investments that just tend to get paused for a little bit until everyone finds out what's what the future is going to look like. So yeah, I'm glad you pointed this one out. Jared, I'd be remiss before we move on from this just to mention a topic that's near and dear to Zane, which is the nonprofit status that a lot of health systems enjoy and the growing sense amongst journalists, be it the New York Times, be it the Boston Globe, as well as some legislators, that that nonprofit status is being abused and that they're not delivering the public benefit that would be commensurate with not paying taxes. And we'll see where that goes. I know it's certainly an important topic for Senator Warren, who represents Massachusetts, where I live, and given her high profile I don't think she's going to let it go in 2024. So that's also something that Zane would encourage us all to be watching. For sure. Do we want to cover one more or do we want to move into our movers and shakers? Let's do one more. I want to give a shout out to Carrie Lykin, also a friend of the show and a dear friend of both of us. She uh, had some wonderful predictions for 2024, and I'm going to lift one of them just because I felt really strongly about it. I weighed in on her LinkedIn post. 
which is around how Google will be changing its search results, possibly in 2024. I say possibly, but it's almost certain that they will be un- uh, rolling out a new layout for search results, which will incorporate generative AI. And we've seen early versions, snapshots of what it could look like. But the upshot is there'll be less links for people to click on, more of a text experience for many search results. And I think what we can reasonably expect is more and more zero-click search results. And that's a term we've used on the show. Those are search results where there's no need to actually click through to your site or my site. The searcher gets the answer they're looking for within the Google experience itself, which is wonderful if you're a user, but it is potentially catastrophic if you're looking to get people to your site for donations or appointments or advertising. So it could be incredibly disruptive. Now, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. They've continued to iterate on the design and the layout. And certainly they're apprehensive about blowing up their advertising business. So I think they're going to move slowly, but it seems almost certain that they're going to make a move in 2024 in some way, shape, or form. So kudos to Kerry for starting that conversation. I I thought it was a really smart one. We should be paying a lot of attention to this. My recent search experience with their, you know, they have it kind of in an experimental stage with generative AI producing results on the search result page. And I've definitely had mixed results, but uh, I'm never one to look at the current state of things and say, yeah, see, look how terrible it is. If anyone knows how to quickly iterate and and scale something, it's Google. So I agree. I clearly expect to to see this. And if we'll just say this, if organizations are still relying on organic and or paid traffic for a majority of website visits as the main way that you achieve your business goal, bless your heart. <laughs> you know, as they say. Like, we've seen this coming for, for many years, and I, I do think it'll come to a head in a new way. If I could, Jared, I'll just touch on a related topic, uh, which I've been writing about pretty extensively, which is uh, the practice of a lot of the generative AI tools of crawling websites and training based on data that they're finding on your site, on my site, on the Mayo Clinic site, on the Cleveland Clinic site. They're not giving attribution and they're not compensating us for the value that we're providing to their large learning models. And there's a growing sense that that's not right. We already see the New York Times, CNN, Reuters, Disney blocking those crawlers and asking for either attribution or compensation or permission. And it's an unraveling topic in the world of healthcare and higher ed, uh, which my work spans. And it's a complex one. I've had conversations, uh, and these are all on LinkedIn, with Amanda Stavorovich from the Cleveland Clinic. And she expressed the dilemma quite well, which is they understand that their content has immense value. They spend a lot of money creating it. In the case of the clinic, they monetize it. So it actually has true business value. At the same time, uh, while it's tempting to block those crawlers and protect that asset, they realize that the Cleveland Clinic and healthcare systems in general have a larger mission to the world of ensuring that the knowledge they're creating is disseminated and available so that people can improve their care. So it's not as easy as just locking out the crawlers and moving on. It's an issue that's, according to Amanda, the subject of immense debate in the clinic. And it should be something that the rest of us are also thinking about. To do nothing, I don't think is wise. It needs to be a strategic decision, possibly one that involves maybe negotiating with Google or negotiating with OpenAI to get that attribution or get that compensation for your content. Something to ponder. Yeah, I love that you brought this one up too, James. You've given us a lot to to put there in the radar screen and and they're all important and they're all things that we've we've been watching and now it seems like they're, they're all going to be taken to the next level in 2024. So, so very cool. Lots to think about here where I'd like to close out with you is our little lightning round are movers and shakers. So these are brands and leaders that you think we'll be talking about the most in 2024. They could be big tech, it could be big retail, it could be traditional providers, it could be digital health brands. Last year, I got I got to give you kudos here, James. Uh, you mentioned it's fun and uh, you know, a little behind the curtain, right? Like we do our prediction series usually a little bit before the end of the year, and last year I think it was a little bit before the end of the year. And then we wondered if we wanted to roll it back a little bit because you mentioned Walmart Health. You said they'd get up to 75 plus clinics, maybe even closer to 100. And shortly after that, it 
felt like maybe that wasn't going to happen. But then once the episode aired, <laughs> we were like, oh, yeah, yeah. The, you know, they started announcing things at the beginning of the year and, and things, too. So I'll mention the other one and then whichever one you want to comment on. You also mentioned that CVS will would move with some new mergers and acquisitions, they'd accelerate their primary care footprint. So, man, I got to give you credit on both of these. Well, Jared, even a broken clock is right a couple times a day, as they say. <laughs> I certainly don't have inside information. I do follow the world of retail health very closely, but yeah, I got lucky with those two. But let me throw out some names for 2024 that I think we'll be talking about. An obvious one is uh, Ryzent, uh, the offshoot of Kaiser Permanente, which acquired Geisinger Health in Pennsylvania and has made a very open pledge that they're looking to acquire four to five similar systems across the country. So we're waiting for that shoe to drop in 2024. Who are the systems that line up with the larger mission of Kaiser Permanente and would be logical additions to the Ryzen organization? We don't know who these are. We could speculate, but that's probably not our place. Um, but I know we'll be talking about them because I suspect we'll see activity there in 2024. Thoughts about that, Jared, or should we keep going? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Another name that I suspect we'll hear uh, from in 2024 is the confusingly named HATCO, <laughs> uh, which is an, an organization, a consortium, if you will, led by the venture capital firm General Catalyst, but it's a consortium of health systems across the country. And they've made a public declaration that they're looking to acquire a health system or at least a large hospital as a testbed for the technology that they've invested in through their venture capital arm. And they're looking to use it as a, yeah, a proving ground, if you will, for what the hospital of the future could look like. So we've never imagined a venture capital firm, even one as high profile as General Catalyst, owning a hospital or operating a health system. So I would dismiss it, except they've made a very public declaration that it's going to happen. And I suspect it's going to happen in 2024. Who and where? We don't know. Yeah, I agree on this one too. I mean, we, we know so little right now. I'm going to make some wild speculation, and this is completely uninformed, which is the most dangerous kind, um, but it's maybe the most fun kind. We watched uh, Humana and Cigna uh, enter into preliminary discussions about a merger. It fell apart. But we have the sense, obviously, that they're not happy with their positions in the market, which is not surprising. They're much smaller than United Health and some of the other giants. So they're looking to strengthen their position. Obviously, they're not in a position to merge now, but I would circle back to uh, speculation, I guess going back four or five years ago when Walmart and Humana were in talks of potentially collaborating. And if you think of the retail giants that we've been following, uh, Walmart's the odd man out in that they've not aligned themselves with an insurer. They've also not gone down the path of huge acquisitions like CVS and Walgreens and Amazon have done. Not to say that they're necessarily going to go down that path, but we know there were talks years ago between Walmart and Humana about aligning their interests. So will we see that uh, take root in 2024? I don't know, but it sure would make for an exciting uh, few weeks and few months if it did. Well, I like it. I mean, you know, these, these are all, it's more informed than you led us to believe there, James. <laughs> there's, there's a lot behind that one. And what would you add, Jared? Do you have uh, some movers and shakers that you want to add? Or is that a Decent enough list for now. I think that was a great list. You know, I, I think I mentioned last week that that I'm still keeping my eye on Best Buy. I speculated probably halfway through the year in a flavor of the week. I made predictions for the second half of 2023 of who we could be talking about. And I brought up Target just because I thought, like, why haven't they done this? And this, I started going down that rabbit hole and thought, you know, if anyone has the brand to do this, and to link a primary care offering or membership or subscription of any kind. I mean, Costco's doing it. Albertsons is doing it. Kroger's doing it. You know, if anyone has the brand power to do that, it's guys. You know, they already have health and wellness products prominently displayed in, in a lot of stores. They just have, like, you walk into the store and you feel it. Like, this place is great. And so there's no information. <laughs> there's no inclination for them to do that at all. They have, they've never dabbled in that space, but. I just think it makes sense, and so I'll, I'll keep I'll keep talking about it. Hopefully, this doesn't become like my my Joe Polizzi prediction that you know that <laughs> you know Apple buys Disney or something. <laughs> but but I do think it makes sense, so I guess I'll keep it. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think Target's been in a long term partnership with CVS to operate a lot of their pharmacies, uh, so they've kind of pursued a zigging while others are zagging strategy. So. 
good for them, but are they happy with it? Will that change in 2024? Hard to say. And I agree with you completely. Best Buy, Best Buy is so well positioned for success in 2024. I think we're going to hear more ongoing wins with health systems to be that last mile uh, delivering hospital at home uh, services and Best Buy is so well positioned to do that. Yeah, they are. And I will say that just that brought to mind the reason why I'm I'm continuing to be bullish on them is because I heard Deborah DeSanzo. I mean, we had her here on the podcast, but then I also heard her speak at Vive in person and just heard the vision for why this is needed, why health at home and the technologies to enable it need to happen. And I'm just like, yeah. So um, my personal goal is to listen more directly from the source you know, and invite people on on here as guests, but to listen to them, and if I can understand their vision, then I tend to be more bullish for what the service is itself, and and kind of leave out the rest. But yeah, this has been a lot of fun, uh, James, giving us a lot to think about. Uh, any final words? No, I'm so excited about the holidays being upon us. I wish you and uh, your family and all our listeners joyous holidays, safe holidays and a very successful and prosperous 2024. Thanks so much. We've well, given us a lot to think about. I've had the absolute pleasure of speaking with James Gardner again. Uh, that's a wrap for this episode. Stay tuned. We've got a lot coming in this this 10th season of ours and for the rest of this year. But in the meantime, thanks so much for joining us today, James. Thanks for having me, Jared. Be well. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again.